Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us for Grand Rounds today. I know it's super busy as always. Um, I think uh, Liz is on TV this week, so I don't know if you have any swap meetings. Uh, but I'm pleased to introduce one of our special guests today. Um, I think you guys have all worked with her probably at some point, um, if you haven't already. But uh, we're here to introduce Dr. Daniela Katie Doda, who's one of our best in medicine specialists. Um, she, along with Dr. Odin, are like our only two medicine mm -hmm. specialists. So, you know, I'll come to her with some really recent cases. Um, Always really appreciate their expertise, so we're really happy to have you here today. Today, she'll be talking to us today about uh, management of front heart disease. So, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Katie. Thank you for having me. Nice to see everybody. Um, so, to kind of take us through things today, I'm going to be using a case um, as kind of a map, a roadmap for a discussion on management of asymptomatic carotid artery disease. And as you know, it can be a really big topic, so I'll, I'll try to focus on um, some, some areas. And specifically, my objectives are, um, after this, hopefully, you'll be able to apply best medical therapy to reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality associated with asymptomatic carotid artery disease, and to compare the options and clinical considerations for carotid revascularization, which these days include endarterectomy, transfemoral stenting, and then also direct um, carotid access for stenting, or TCAR. So um, we'll start with the patient who actually came to me with a slow healing foot ulcer um, that had been present for about four months. Um, we underdid diagnostic testing, which demonstrated um, that he had PAD and a possible dissection in the infrarenal abdominal aorta. Um, his past medical history was significant for left arm weakness that had self-resolved in about 10 years ago. Um, he was in PR at that time, and so the details surrounding this were really kind of unknown. Um, in terms of comorbidities, he had diabetes, hypertension, and BPH, um, and a family history that was significant for diabetes, but no known vascular um, conditions in his family. In terms of medications, um, the ones that I was focused on were his Losartan, Zatorvastatin, 20 milligrams, aspirin, and then Novolog. Um, he was a former smoker and had just quit the year prior to me seeing him and had recently moved to PR to live with his daughter due to basically a general decline, um, which really was gait instability, recurrent hospitalizations for UTIs, um, and requiring a walker to kind of get around. So on physical exam, um, his blood pressures were equal in both arms, and he had a very loud right systolic brewy. Um, heart and lung exam were normal. Um, his abdomen had no brewies. And his vascular exam had absent um, popliteal, PT, and DP pulses bilaterally, in addition to this um, very small ulcer on the bottom of his um, right foot that was almost healed, actually, by the time I met him. Um, so in terms of labs, his LDL was 68. Um, his hemoglobin A1C was 7.7. Um, GFR was 42. And he had a hemoglobin of 11.8. So this is his aorta with runoff. It's going to play through. Um, not sure why it's going back and forth like that. Sorry. But basically what I want to draw your attention to, if you watch the aorta as we go down into the abdomen, um, you're going to see that there's a lot of atherosclerotic plaque, including um, a lot of homogeneous, almost thrombus looking. You can see the plaque there. That's thrombus overlying plaque. Um, so it's a really ugly looking aorta all the way into his um, extremities. So he didn't end up having a dissection, which was what we thought he had in the infrarenal aorta based on ultrasound. It was just badly ulcerated black. And then we did a carotid duplex to work up his brewery, and sure enough, he had an 80 to 99 um, carotid stenosis um, on the right. And so what you're seeing is um, on <coughs> color... Uh, a lot of atherosclerotic plaque with narrowing and um, color turbulence, and then velocities of 523 peak systolic velocity and diastolic velocity of 171. Um, to get to an 80 to 99, you really uh, need to be over 170 for the peak systolic velocity. It's the end diastolic velocity that gets you to that 80 to 99 range. So he met all criteria for that. Um, so in terms of questions um, at this point for the case, um, number one is further cardiovascular assessment needed. We looked at his extremities. We looked at his, his neck vessels. We know that atherosclerosis is a systemic disease. Um, do we need to do further 
investigation um, to work up his coronaries. Uh, two, would you optimize him or how would you optimize him medically and what are your goals with therapy? And three, how frequently would you monitor this patient with duplex ultrasound if you're going to be following him going forward? So um, starting with just kind of a general overview, uh, this is the vital statistics data showing deaths due to cardiovascular disease and about 70% of which are due to strokes. And about a third of those, up to a third of those, are due to extracranial atherosclerotic carotid artery disease. Um, now, there is an increasing understanding of the risk for polyvascular disease and that this carries uh, a real morbid and mortal um, trajectory for our patients. So this is data from the REACH registry, which is an international outpatient study of patients with stable symptomatic vascular disease, or those that were at high risk. Um, they looked at CAD stroke, uh, TIA, PAD, or multiple risk factors for um, vascular events. And at three years, follow-up data was available for over 30,000 patients with symptomatic disease from 44 countries. And the breakdown is shown there for anywhere from CAD only to cardiovascular disease to PAD to any combination of the three. And um, what was really interesting that came out of this is, um, number one, the burden of PAD in terms of vascular death and focusing today on cerebrovascular disease on um, the red uh, bar up there. Not surprisingly, there was a higher rate of non-fatal stroke for patients that had cerebrovascular disease. But if you look at the bottom, the red represents polyvascular disease, whereas the blue is a single vascular bed. And having disease in more than one vascular bed absolutely had a higher rate of vascular death or MI stroke vascular death or any combination of the two. And so we're realizing that these patients really need to be treated much, much more aggressively and we probably need to be actively looking for vascular disease in more than one vascular bed. Although that will not always be covered uh, by insurance unless patients have symptoms. It's another conversation. Um, but in terms of our goals for best medical therapy for these patients, it's, it's number one, pretty obvious, reduce death, reduce stroke, and then reduce myocardial infarction um, to bring down the morbidity associated with atherosclerosis in general. So how do we do that? Well. Um, like we think about for our patients with CAD, uh, it's a combination of good antithrombotic therapy and for patients with PAD or cerebrovascular disease, there's good data for uh, P2Y12 inhibition with Plavix um, or Ticagrelor. I'm going to focus a little bit on the COMPASS trial that came out um, last year, which is actually combining low-dose aspirin with low-dose rivaroxaban. Um, and that was a very positive study that actually was stopped early um, because it was so positive. Um, in terms of antihypertensive medications, the ACE inhibitors um, have shown across all vascular disease to bring down mortality. Um, and lipid lowering medications with high intensity statins, uh, Zetia or PCSK9 inhibitors if we can't get patients to goal in diabetes control. And of course, smoking cessation and a surveillance strategy to follow them going forward. So focusing on COMPASS, um, this was a study that randomized over 27,000 patients with stable atherosclerotic disease, um, again, to low-dose rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams twice a day with aspirin, 100 milligrams, um, rivaroxaban, 5 milligrams BID, or aspirin daily. Um, it was a double-line, double-dummy, randomized control trial. Um, and they enrolled patients with PAD, CAD, um, if they were over age 65, or if they were under the age of 65, they had to have polyvascular disease or at least two risk factors. Um, and the trial, as I mentioned, was stopped early for superiority for the combined low-dose rivaroxaban with aspirin group after 23 months. It demonstrated a relative risk reduction of 24% for patients with rivaroxaban and um, aspirin versus aspirin alone for a cumulative risk of cardiovascular death, stroke, or MI. And that's, that's more positive than any trial that's come out um, for atherosclerosis in many, many years. And particularly, the PAD subgroup, which included up to 5,000 patients, or a little less than 5,000 patients, um, replicated those findings, basically. And 25% of the PAD subgroup were included because they had carotid artery disease greater than 50%. Um, so it's, it may be a little bit hard to see in the back, but 
um, basically the hazard ratio for low dose rivaroxaban plus aspirin versus aspirin alone is 0.72, so relative risk reduction of 28% for cardiovascular death stroke or MI um, in patients getting the combination therapy. And um, and then just go down in the iterations. And there was um, a significant increase or decrease in the rate of stroke, has a ratio of 0.54. So I think um, this is something that hasn't had a lot of uptake in terms of treatment for our patients. Um, I think it's a combination of the drug being expensive um, and probably availability in, in the pharmacies. We've had some trouble finding pharmacies that actually stock it still. Um, and maybe also because our patients are, it's difficult to ask them to take a twice daily medication. You know, you had a new diagnosis, you're adding on twice daily rivaroxaban with aspirin. Um, it's, a, it's a big burden in addition to statins and all the other medical therapies that you're throwing at them. Have yeah. you had insurances paid for this medication? Yes, but it depends on, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think this is really promising data. Um, so it be interesting to see where it goes. Relevant, there was, yes. There, there was an increasing, exactly. Clinically um, non relevant major bleeding. Um, and they were very conservative in the bleeding um, definition that they use, so it could just be presenting to a provider with bleeding, not necessarily critical organ bleeding or um, anything like that was not statistically significant. Um, okay, well, what about monitoring carotid disease? Um, so, this is a um, study looking at about 1,200 patients with asymptomatic greater than 50% carotid artery stenosis. They followed them for up to four years, being followed for four years. Um, and it was an international cohort <coughs> looking to see cerebrovascular risk stratification potential of clinical and imaging characteristics um, at baseline and then following them forward. So they used Q6 month um, ultrasounds to follow patients. And um, Patients were on good medical therapy left up to the ordering providers um, or the caring providers. And what they found was that for patients that had progression, there was an increase in TIA and stroke um, and other events, amaurosis, Bugax, as compared to patients that had no change. Um, and so definitely this and other studies have demonstrated that when you see progression, it identifies a higher risk group um, who may be at risk for TIA stroke or other cerebrovascular events. Now, um, the one thing that came out of this study was that the majority of the strokes that they actually saw was not necessarily in the progression group. So if you look, the number of strokes overall was pretty low, 59 total out of you know, 1,200 or so patients. Um, so they suggested that perhaps screening everybody doesn't make sense every six months. And again, they included patients with stenosis from 50 to 99%. Um, but I would say certainly for your patient with a greater than 70% stenosis, it makes sense to monitor them every six months with ultrasound. Because if you do identify progression, you can feel a little bit more confident about that patient being um, suitable for revascularization. Okay, so coming back to the case of the 73-year-old gentleman, diabetic, former smoker, who had extensive PAD and an 80 to 99 right ICA stenosis. Um, I just want to remind you his history was notable for transient left arm weakness um, a little over 10 years ago when he was living in PR. So that, um, you know, localizes to the lesion that we identified, although it's been a long time now. Um, and he was recently started on medical therapy with a moderate intensity statin, aspirin, and an arm. So what we ended up doing was optimizing his medications. Um, we bumped him up to Crestor 40. We changed him to Clopidogrel. We added metformin. Um, we had him start monitoring home blood pressures um, and optimized his ARP. And then referred him for a nuclear medicine stress test to complete the evaluation because, again, we looked at every other vascular bed except for the coronaries. Um, and his exercise tolerance was pretty low given that he was ambulating with a walker. So this is his EKG, um, which demonstrated a left axis deviation, um, but otherwise a normal sinus rhythm um, and nothing really remarkable. But his um, nuclear medicine stress test showed um, mild to moderate apicolateral ischemia and severe lateral scarring and an EF of 30%. That was not known. Um, so we ended up 
sending him for a stress test to assess his functional capacity, um, and he was unable to complete two meds because of fatigue. Um, so given the scarring, we potentially sending him for a coronary path, but because there was scarring, we decided against it, um, and we decided to just optimize him medically um, from here. So um, next set of questions, would you revascularize the right carotid artery, knowing what we know about him, EF of 30%, bad disease, uh, extensive atherosclerosis, we'll get into kind of the different options for revascularization too. Um, and what strategies or data do you use to decide if an asymptomatic lesion should be revascularized? And if the coronary ischemia was reversible, how would we decide to proceed from that point? So in terms of guidelines, um, the guidelines tell us that endarterectomy is reasonable if your stenosis is greater than 70% um, and your perioperative risk for stroke MI or death is less than 3%. And prophylactic stenting may be considered for highly selected asymptomatic disease. And then those patients at high risk of complications, um, the effectiveness of best medical revascularization is un uncertain. Um, so kind of wishy-washy in some ways. Um, the European Society of Cardiology came out with this, which I thought was a little bit more nuanced um, recently last year. And so if we think about our asymptomatic patient um, who has a stenosis of 60 to 99%, they ask, um, you know, is there favorable anatomy? Are there features to suggest a higher stroke risk on best medical therapy? So it starts getting into how to identify the higher risk asymptomatic lesions. So um, the way that we can identify those lesions are looking for disease progression, um, the type of plaque that's present. So there's data to show that homogeneous plaque or plaque hemorrhage and ulceration has a higher risk um, for ischemic events seeing high intensity signals on transcranial Doppler, those are microemboli, um, and then silent events that are on brain CT or MR can sometimes help us uh, pick up these patients. So in terms of the transcranial Doppler detection of emboli, uh, this was a study looking at patients with greater than 70% stenosis followed for a year and a half, and they underwent TCD, they got to a baseline, and then duplex and brain imaging and were followed for every six months. And what they found was at baseline, there were 77 embolic events, which are these just bright signals that you can see um, on the transcranial Doppler. When they do this, they have to monitor it for over an hour to try to pick up signals. So it's extremely labor intensive um, and time consuming. And in terms of the outcomes, patients that had embolic signals present at baseline had higher rates of ipsilateral stroke and TIA um, during the follow up. So it has a ratio of 2.54 for the combination and 5.57 for ipsilateral stroke alone. And that held um, even when it was adjusted for age, sex, and antiplatelet therapy. Um, so it definitely is a way to detect increased risk. It's not something, again, that we're using routinely, mostly because of how difficult it, it is and how labor intensive it is. Um, but it's, it's something that's out there if you've got someone that you're really worried about. And then here's some examples of high-risk plaques that we can see on just carotid duplex. So to orient you, the head is on the left of the screen. So that plaque up there that's waving is on the wrong side of the lesion. Um, and that was an 80 to 99% stenosis. What you can see here on B flow, where the arrow is pointing, is ulcerated plaque. So we're getting some flow into an area of plaque. Um, and then this was a patient I saw who actually had crazy homogeneous plaque, actually. On CTA, it wasn't even called. But if you look very closely, this is calcification surrounding the carotid bulb. And all of this black is homogeneous black. And that's what correlated with duplex. So these are all high-risk lesions um, that would make me think more strongly towards revascularizing a patient. Um, OK. So what about the risk of cardiovascular events for our patients with asymptomatic carotid disease? Um, so this study is looking at 2,684 consecutive patients um, with atherosclerotic disease or, or type 2 diabetes, but no history of cerebral ischemia. And they had a greater than 50% uh, asymptomatic stenosis 
assessed by duplex was identified in 8% of patients. And for those that had it, there was a higher rate of non-vascular death, vascular death, or any vascular event um, during follow-up, which was for a couple years. In terms of when we're thinking about managing these um, two conditions together, I think we have to consider the overall um, risk of the procedure. So meaning if we've got a patient who's going for a coronary intervention, the risk of stroke really is highest for surgery, cabbage, more than coronary cath, which is less than 1%. For cabbage, it's estimated the overall incidence of perioperative stroke is about 1% to 3%, which is much less than what it was previously, with most happening within 48 hours of surgery. Um, and the prevalence of carotid disease in patients undergoing cabbage is as high as 6 to 14%. Uh, but when you think about the etiology of stroke with cabbage, it's actually the minority that are due to um, large vessel occlusive disease. Most of these end up being embolic, either from aortic clamping um, or cardioembolic events due to atrial fibrillation, hypoperfusion um, during the event. So um, it, it ends up being a case by case assessment um, when patients going into surgery, as you know. Um, so this study was looking at patients um, who underwent cabbage between 2003 and 2009 and had either severe carotid disease, defined as greater than 70% or non-severe. Um, and what I thought was interesting about the study, these are the baseline characteristics um, and as well as what procedure the patient ended up going under um, for cabbage. Patients with severe carotid stenosis were older and had higher rates of PAD, not super surprising there. Um, there was no difference in terms of the number of, um, I'm sorry, there was a difference in the number of diseased vessels and specifically left main disease was higher in patients with severe carotid disease um, and there was a higher rate of emergent procedures done in patients with severe carotid disease. So overall a higher risk group, um, but no difference in the number of grafts that patients received. And um, what ended up what they ended up finding during follow-up was that there was no difference in stroke mortality, perioperative MI, or 30-day mortality between these two groups. Um, so I think what this is reflecting partly is improved medical therapy um, with asymptomatic carotid disease. Uh, so, you know, it's, yeah. The way that I consider patients when I see them with both coronary and parotid disease is number one, um, which, which area is symptomatic? That's the one that needs to be addressed first. Um, in terms of screening, the guidelines will tell us older patients, those with left main disease, PAD, tobacco use, tri prior stroke or TIA and carotid brewery should be, should be screened um, before cabbage with a carotid uh, duplex. In terms of revascularization though, for asymptomatic disease, it's really only those with bilateral disease or who have 80 to 99 and then a contralateral occlusion. For a single lesion that's asymptomatic, you don't need to be revascularizing your patient prior to cabbage necessarily. Um, and then in terms of management strategies, um, there are many. So you can either do synchronous or staged procedures, most often it's staged, and then endarterectomy versus stenting, um, and the parameters surrounding that depend a lot on patient anatomy, use of DAPT, um, which may play into Know, putting out cabbage potentially if you decide to do this beforehand. Um, so those all need to be considered. And um, some other variables affecting the decision tree listed there. Now in terms of the evolution of carotid intervention, getting into now the nuances of each procedure and how we, how we manage these people, um, really over here, um, starting in the 90s, we started looking at, random, there were many randomized controlled trials comparing stenting versus um, endarterectomy. And more, more recently now, we've started to see the onset of TPAR, um, which I will present to you if you guys haven't seen that yet. Um, I know you co-manage with vascular surgery, so you may have come across it um, already. But what I've done here is list uh, the major trials uh, by date and then as well as asymptomatic versus symptomatic disease and um, the 30-day stroke or death rates for each of these. 
Um, and in terms of general trends, what you can see is that there's a higher rate of 30-day stroke or death for symptomatic, more than asymptomatic, not surprising, and that the overall rates of these events has gone down over time with increased operator experience. But um, kind of holding fast is the fact that for stenting, that rate is always higher than endarterectomy. And then in terms of follow-up over time, um, at about four or five years or so, um, the risk reduction for um, surgery versus medical therapy is probably about five or six percent. Um, and only one study actually looked at medical therapy versus um, endarterectomy in 2010. But again, over time, these numbers have come way down, up in the 30s and the early 90s, um, and now down to about the 5-6% range more recently. And um, the CREST trial, which was referenced from someone, um, I think really in this, so that compared endarterectomy to um, carotid artery stenting. It included both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. Um, and I think there were three kind of big findings from that. Number one, at about the age of 70, there's a hinge point where the benefit of endarterectomy um, outweighs stenting. So patients do better with their older with endarterectomy. Um, endarterectomy is associated with a higher rate of MI than stenting, and stenting is associated with a higher rate of stroke. Um, not surprising when you consider the procedure. Right, and the burden of it. And I think the age factor makes sense when you think about it that way because you've got calcification, more vascular disease, um, and so there's a higher rate of stroke when you try to stent those patients um, in those lesions. Other things that you can do to try to improve outcomes. Um, so in addition, you know, age shown here, symptomatic and asymptomatic disease, um, again, in terms of death, stroke, and MI, endpoints, um, but the use of, a, of an embolic protection device um, with predilation decreases the rate of events significantly. And that's now really become standard as they've um, improved the procedure. And I think that's one of the reasons why with time we've seen those event rates come down. And um, this represents the evolution of optimal medical therapy. So uh, this is enrollment across one of the studies that was in that grid that I was showing. Um, and what's happened with medical therapy over time as patients have been followed. So lipid lowering has dramatically increased, um, and again, showing you when Jupiter came out and then generic uh, atorvastatin became available, the rate of antihypertensive um, agents increased as well. And with all of these changes, we've started to see the event rates with asymptomatic carotid disease go down dramatically. So what have we learned through this all over, the, through all this time? Number one, um, endarterectomy reduces long-term risk of stroke compared to pre-contemporary medical therapy. Um, it's about five to six percent over five years. Stenting has never actually been compared to medical therapy alone in a randomized control trial. And the incidence of non-disabling and periprocedural stroke with stenting has been higher than endarterectomy in every randomized control trial that compares the two to date. Um, and these days, the annual incidence of stroke with contemporary medical treatment may be as low as 0.5 to 1% per year. So that's on par to annual rates after endarterectomy or stenting. And that's why there's so much controversy surrounding who you should actually send for this procedure. Now, just a word about CREST-2, because I think this will help clarify some of this for us. So this is a parallel multicenter randomized trial that's ongoing right now, and it's comparing endarterectomy to best medical therapy and stenting to best medical therapy. Um, and there are actual risk factor targets for best medical therapy, including an LDL less than 70 and blood pressure targets. And the primary outcome um, is composite, composite stroke and death within 44 days, and ipsilateral stroke up to four years. In terms of secondary outcomes, they're looking at changes in cognition and differences in minor and major strokes. But I think this will be a huge addition to the literature in terms of us understanding what to do with these patients today. The problem is not everybody's going to get randomized. So you have a patient like the image I showed you with the plaque flapping, and I don't know that you're necessarily going to feel comfortable randomizing that person to this. Um, and so I think that will always be the case, um, but it should help some of us. So, okay, a word on transcarotid artery vascularization. You guys seen 
these patients much? Vascular surgery is involved with the trial, so okay. So this I think is interesting. This is targeting the high risk patient. So what it is is direct carotid access, um, and then a mechanism for flow reversal, and then the blood is put back in through the femoral vein, and then they're able to stent through that direct carotid access. So the idea is you reduce the risk for stroke associated with stenting by putting on flow reversal, um, and you do the direct stenting. This can actually be done with local, um, so you know for your really high risk patient, and you don't you know you bypass the whole femoral access, which means going through a really atherosclerotic aorta like my patient, um, and flicking off plaque everywhere. So. Um, it's getting a lot of buzz in the vascular surgery. Yeah. So aren't you denying blood flow to the brain while the blood is flowing in the reverse direction? <laughs> so it, a little bit. Um, and I actually did ask one of the surgeons, do you guys do brain imaging to make sure they have an intact circle of Willis before you put them in this? And he said they don't routinely do that. So I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it was one of the things I was worried about too. Yeah. It's uh, basically like a... Yeah, suction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> suction, yeah. Um, and so who's eligible for this? They're targeting really high-risk people. So patients with contralateral carotid artery occlusion, tandem stenosis, a hostile neck with prior radiation, for example, patients that are re-stenosed after endarterectomy. Your older patients, those with CAD, those with CHF, a recent MI, more than 72 hours and less than six weeks prior to procedure, COPD, um, CKD, and they're excluded if they've got a prior stent in the target artery, and then there's some anatomic parameters that they need just to be able to do the procedure. We love hospital men. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess if they're asymptomatic, I would probably, that's a good question. Um, I would I would probably target the, the worst looking lesion if there's truly no symptoms. Or that might be a case where I actually do a brain MRI to look for silent ischemic events and see if one of these lesions is, is silently symptomatic. Um, and then consider doing the other side or at least monitoring it longer term. Yeah, but that, it's pretty rare that we pick up patients like that. It's usually one side is more stenosis than the other. Um, okay, so this is data um, on TCAR comparing transfemoral carotid stenting versus TCAR. Um, this comes from the Vascular Quality Initiative um, through SVS. And they showed a reduced rate of in-hospital TIA in stroke with TCAR, 1.9% versus 3.3%, as well as TIA stroke in death um, during follow-up. And in terms of in-hospital adverse neurologic events and TIA stroke in death, there was a two times higher rate with transfemoral carotid artery stenting compared to TCAR. Um, they've also looked at TCAR versus endarterectomy. This was presented as an abstract um, to the SBS meeting last year, and it also looks promising. So um, we'll see when the actual data comes out. But for these higher risk patients, it's another thing in the in the arsenal. Um, here's just some more information on the TCAR versus transfemoral stenting patients. Um, so higher age in the TCAR patients, um, symptomatic CAS is actually less than transfemoral, higher rates of CAD, prior cabbage, CHF, ipsilateral stenosis, anatomic or medical high risk, and higher ASA class um, than patients that are going transfemoral carotid artery stenting. Um, okay, so back to my case. Uh, my patient returned for follow-up every six months and was actually doing stable, uh, stably for a while. And then about a year and a half after I saw him, his velocities bumped up. So he went from a peak systolic velocity of 532 to 601, and then end diastolic 167 to 308, despite aggressive medical therapy. Um, and again, we had him really optimized, I think. So his LDL was 28 on Crestor 40. Um, his hemoglobin A1C came down to 7.3. We had his pressures well controlled. We had um, put him on good heart failure regimen, and his EF actually improved to 45%. Um, but 
given the progression, um, which is just the image shown here, it looks kind of visually very similar, but the velocities have definitely increased. Um, I talked to him about TCAR. I didn't think he was a good candidate for transfemoral stenting, given what we knew his aorta looked like. Um, and I didn't think with his, his cardiac comorbidities that he would uh, be a good candidate for end arterectomy. So um, TCAR felt like a good fit for him, but he was really hesitant. Um, despite that, I would say about a month later, he actually had a ischemic event on that side, localized to the lesion. Um, and so surgery took him for TCAR like a couple weeks after that, and now he's doing okay. Um, and I did change it aspirin with rivaroxaban, just trying to optimize him in any way that I could at that point. But, um, okay, so in summary, we discussed um, best medical therapy to reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality associated with asymptomatic disease. We discussed some strategies to try to identify patients at high risk for ischemic events um, and compare the options and clinical considerations for carotid revascularization. It was kind of a whirlwind through the literature, um, but thank you very much for having me, and I'll take any questions if there are any. How long have you been using the procedure? The actual procedure itself? I think probably an hour. It's not very long. Um, yeah, it's not a very long procedure. Usually those patients are after the regular floor, or they have one no, they're on a regular floor, maybe like the ticky, but they're, yeah, they're on a, a monitored floor, but not necessarily the ICU, and they're usually discharged within a couple days. They do require DAPT, just like a carotid stent would, any other carotid stent would, um, so, you know, that's important to know. Any additional complications compared to the regular um, stent? Not that I've seen, no, but uh, again, they're targeting very high-risk patients, so... Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>